Welcome to Impact Farming, where we introduce you to the people and ideas that will have a massive impact on your farming operation. Brought to you by Farm Marketer. Sit down, start the engine, and let's roll with today's show. With an ever-increasing demand for potassium due to increasing crop yields, there is a need for a better source of potassium with improved availability and uptake potential. Alpine K-Tech is the most plant-available form of potassium and is able to enter the plant quickly and easily. As a foiler application, K-Tech is tank-mixable with many crop protection products, thereby increasing the grower's resource use efficiency. K-Tech offers balanced fertility and an added energy source for the plant. The latest development of premium crop nutrition is doing a lot more with a lot less for your crops. Learn more at www.alpinepfl.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Impact Farming Show. We are back with Elaine Freeze today for part two of our transition planning secrets of success series. Welcome back, Elaine. Glad to be here. I am very excited to be following up on last week's episode. Last week, we spoke to the founders of the farm, giving them the best of Elaine Fraze's wisdom on planning for success. Now, today, we're going to be speaking to Generation 2, the successors. I am excited. Are you? I'm just curious how many founders are going to be watching this, too, to find out what they really need to know. You know, I am actually thinking when we type up the show notes and promote these episodes, I'm going to encourage both generations to watch the other one. Right. Speak about communication. Shouldn't it be clear what we're encouraging each generation to do so that they Mm -hmm. know, even um, if they're generation two, some things that they can encourage founders to do. So I think there is a lot of value in our audience watching both episodes hope so I think so I know so the best of a lame phrase so why don't we start with the mindset for gen 2 so gen 2 typically to me um, Tracy is somewhere in the age range of mid-20s to almost 40 and if you're older than 40 and you still are considered not yet the successor then there's a lot more tension going on than there needs to be. So the mindset that I want Generation 2 to have is, um, again, be patient. This is a journey. This is not a what I call the roundup solution and it happens in 10 days and you get a solution. So I know that they've already been patient because when they come to me at age 35, they typically say, Elaine, I've given you know the last 11 years of my life or 15 years to this farm after I got back from college. There were promises made and nothing ever seems to change. And quite frankly, I'm getting tired of it. So the mindset that I want them to have is to be gracious, to be calm, but I also want them to ask for what they need. And I I want them to ask for what they need with good documentation. And and so part of that would be to know the numbers. And, And they'll say, well, Elaine, I don't know the numbers. Well, have you had family meetings to talk about getting to know the numbers. I also want them to have a relationship with their own lender because I actually would like them to go to their lender right now with the current net worth that they have and say, how much am I good for? And I had a farmer in Saskatchewan, I won't name the town that he was from, but he was young in his mid thirties, wife and children. And his dad was really being difficult to deal with. So I sent his father to the financial planner, which we talked about in the other episode. And this young man went to um, Farm Credit Canada, actually, and he came back and he said, oh, Elaine. I said, what happened? He said, I'm good for $750,000. I said, yes. Because you see, that gives power in understanding what the next gen, what gen two is willing to leverage in terms of debt, Tracy, because the founders are afraid of failure. They're afraid of the next gen taking things over, getting too much ownership, and then five years down the road, just flipping it and cashing out the farm. That's not a valid fear. It's not a valid fear if you've had the conversation around how passionate and committed are you to this business and how long do you plan to stay in the game, even when it gets tough. And it's tough in 2020 for a lot of farms, right? 
and it kind of will separate out the wheat and the chaff again in, in that toughness. So the mindset has to be, what, it, what can I do to show up to the table with something to offer my parents? And the other offer would be the business plan. Because the other fear is that I just alluded to is, you know, Elaine, I don't think my, my son and daughter are really committed to this. They, they're just always going off and doing other things. And like their heart's just not in it. And I said, well, you might be assuming that, but that's not what they told me. So again, that one page business plan in terms of what their vision is for the farm is again, more data for the family to look at and, and to evaluate. You know, I love that. And when I hear you say that, I take off the farmer cap and I go to the business world. If you are going to buy a business or you want to be taken seriously, you prepare a business plan, you prepare some financial projections, and then you go to get a loan or present it to the person that you're making the proposal. And that is commonplace outside of agriculture. And what a great way, if you're frustrated that your parents aren't taking you serious, what a great way to show up looking like a business person. Well, and, and again, and then last episode too, Tracy, we talked about importance of communication too. So part of the mindset is what else do you need to communicate to your parents in terms of how you think about them or what you intend to share with them? Because lack of appreciation is one of the top three reasons why succession plans are not successful. Okay. The other one, the other one is lack of forgiveness, like not letting go of, the, go of past hurts and, and bitterness or resentment. And then the third thing is pride and stubbornness. And this is all based on the work of Tom Hubler, who was my small is my uh, student coach mentor when I in two, way back in two thousand and three when I first became a certified coach. And so you look at lack of appreciation. Are you kidding me? Like my husband's best gifts are cards from our successor son who say, dear dad, thank you for trusting me. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you for giving me equity when I was only 21. You know, like wow. all the things that, yeah, words of affirmation and appreciation. So when you talk about attitude and mindset, are you going to be kind, gracious, and compassionate to your parents through this process? Mm. Because yeah. we, always, we always get to choose. And, you know, I read a proverb every day. So today is the 8th of July. I read Proverbs 8, and it's all about wisdom. And it talks about honey's going to get you a lot further than vinegar. Mm. And, and I, I just don't get it, Tracy, why people don't understand that even if tension is high around this transition process, you can still be calm, you can still be clear, you can still be kind and gracious and ask really good questions. So that mindset attitude piece, I, and again, every frustrated successor in Gen 2 gets to choose their response in how they're going to react. And, and I remember sitting around at a Bridging the Gap grad uh, group in Winnipeg at Farm Management Canada's Excellence Conference. And I just wanted to mention, if anyone can't do a business plan, go to Farm Management Canada and start ravaging all their agri webinars and, and get help doing a business plan if that's not your strong suite already. But at this, at this group of high performing young farmers, we cry, there was tears. You could not imagine the emotional weight on these young people because they just said, Elaine, I never know if I'm good enough. Oh. I have no idea. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? I said, you've given 11 years already. And, and there were a couple of in that situation, much like my personal situation, where they were also carrying a disabled and special needs sibling. So not only are they expected to continue on and be successful in the farm business, they are also expected to be part of that family circle and continue on the, the care of the family, which is another burden in itself, right? Yeah. So the mindset is, is if I don't know something, I'm going to ask and I'm going to do it with respect. And in conflict resolution terms, the mindset is also my intent is not to cause harm. My intent, dad and mom, is not to shove you off this farm. And that is another fear of Gen 1, is they feel like they're getting pushed off. Mm -hmm. They're not getting pushed off, but their roles are going to have to change, Tracy. And that's, again, what we talked about in the other episode about 
how hard it is to let go. So that attitude piece and, and how you show up to come into this journey is really important. I love something that you said in our other episode with the founders, empathy. And, you know, I think in my entire life, one of the biggest life changes I've had was when I learned to put myself in another person's shoes and, and think about the fact that, okay, they're coming off this way. They're probably not doing that to ruin my life. Wait a minute. <laughs> intentionally. Yeah, intentionally. So maybe my parents are scared that I'm going to push them off the farm. Maybe they're well, scared they won't have enough income. What are they feeling, right? That empathy. I love that you said that in the other episode. I wanted to bring that back up here. Well, and that's part of that discovery process when we go into exploring, right? So my process as a coach, counseling is about recovery. Coaching is about discovery. So I want to explore what everybody needs, what they're thinking, feeling, needing, and wanting. And here's the phrase. I think mom and dad, it's time that we started having regular meetings to talk about the future of this business and how it's going to go down in terms of the shift of labor, which of course has already happened because here I am as Gen 2 with my new strong back and my college degree and my PA to do an amazing job. And sometimes a degree in engineering. I meet a lot of engineers on the farm. Okay. Yeah. So change of labor, but then there's a sticky piece around the, the change of management. And that's hard to let go for those Gen 1s who have the fear of failure. So then the other thing you need to explore is how much financial transparency you have, which is why I want to send you to FCC or a credit union or a bank or wherever you like to, to get money from to explore what you're good for. Because also you have to have an understanding of working capital. And if you've been a follower of Dr. David Cole and all this, or Terry, um, Becker, Backswath Management or Farm Management Canada and, and York Zimmerman and all those great people who are really good farm management specialists, you're not, you have to know your numbers. And, and those, those young people who farm their numbers, there's actually a competition sponsored by RBC called Farm Your Numbers. And the woman who won it was a young woman dairy farmer from Nova Scotia named Veronica. And she got $25,000. Wow. Now, you too could do that. So again, Google Farm Your Numbers and get involved in that contest and learn to be financially transparent because money is something that people tend to be afraid of. There's either not enough, which is the scarcity mindset, mm -hmm. or there is enough, which is the abundance mindset. And I, I, I come from a place of position of abundance. I don't come from there's never enough. But how this shows up for Gen 2 <laughs> And I'll use a perfect example. I'm not naming names here, but I have a Gen 2 family right now that's going to spend over $100,000 on a house renovation for the home yard, right? We talked about this last week, last time. They want to move into the home yard because she's a mother of young children and she wants to see her husband, who's a cattle farmer, who's not home very much. But he's also choosing not to block time off for the family. So we're going to work on that piece. But... But the money that they spend on that home renovation will make her happy, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But I would, as a young farmer, make a different decision. And I did because when Wes and I first got married in July 4th, 1981, and we moved into his parents' farmhouse three months later, I had brown towels on wooden Coke boxes, Tracy, as my end tables. The couch I sat on, Dawn Rain dropped off at our house instead of taking it to the dump. And we were extremely happy because the money that we pooled together in our marriage didn't go into the house. It went into the farm. Exactly. And, and, and again, that's a value choice. So here's my warning and my concern for Gen 2. When I go or used to be able to go to your houses to have conversations with you, I'd walk in and go, oh, looks like HGTV has come to fruition here or Martha Stewart's been here and it's beautiful and there's granite countertops and no judgment, but David Chilton, the wealthy barber said, Canadians are suffering from granite top syndrome because you're not successful, Tracy, unless you have granite in your kitchen. Did you know that? 
Don't look at my cupboards then. You want to hear a funny story, Elaine? We we did a reno of a very small part of the house when we moved in because it had to be done. Like it was unfinished. And then you look at my cupboards and they're not glorious by any means. And I'd love to change them. But I looked at that. I said, that's a twenty to thirty thousand dollar plus reno. I can buy a lot of cows that will make me money every year. So I'm going to put that kitchen off and I'm going to buy my nice kitchen a little bit down the line. I'm going to invest in assets that make me money right now. So, so, so Tracy, we've just lost half the viewership. They go, Oh, I don't like how these women are talking. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's Sorry. The number but, but again, okay. So here's the phrase that pays different is not wrong. Right. It's just different. Yes. And so if you put a high value on making things nice in your house, good for you. Go at it. And who knows? Maybe you are a vet. I have clients who are veterinarians. I have clients who are doctors. Um, they're married to farmers or vice versa. Or the farmer is the vet or whatever. So their income stream is there and they have some cash flow to put together. And I'm not no judging judgment. your decision. But what I'm saying is in Gen 2, you want to pay attention to working capital and debt and also your debt servicing capacity. And in a spousal relationship, if you're the farm woman and you're taking over your mother and father's farm and your husband comes from a paycheck family and he's not happy about being in a $600,000 operating line, then you have to have some more conversations around short-term, you know, current debt, intermediate debt, and long-term debt, which is what I was bathed in for 10 years when I was a farm debt mediator and sitting at the table with people who weren't managing those three numbers very well, right? Because they weren't able to make their payments. So when you know where you're at financially, that's one piece on the debt side. But Gen 2, the other piece that they have to be careful about is family living. Because they'll say, oh, Elaine, I only need 40 grand a year net. And I go, you're lying or else you're getting a lot of perks from the farm. And I have a compensation worksheet by Dick Whitman. I have his whole toolbox and he's a fantastic advisor from Idaho. Many of you have heard him speak. His website is Whitman, W-I-T-T-M-A-N consulting.com. He has a fabulous farm management binder, which I think you all should run out and buy for $150 U.S., Because he has so many templates to help you get these financial transparency conversations going. So the one about family living that really irks me is a lot of families have $14,000 to $20,000 worth of perks, Tracy. So that that perk might come in uh, garden, garden stuff. So food from the garden or a half a beef, a half a pig, 20 chickens. Uh, unlimited access to the diesel tank or the gas tank, the purple gas, you know, and, and this becomes a point of contention because it's not really well tracked and it's not clean accounting. And then we have all those famous farmhouses on grandpa's old yard or the neighbor down the street who you've written, you know, you bought that farm and, oh yeah, Lane, we get to live for free. Well, that's okay for the time being, but that's probably not going to be a forever thing. And it's also a false sense of security because you don't really know what your number is for what you need to live at the level that you want to live. And, you know, what COVID has done, it's taken away hockey season and ball season and camping, but people are still spending money, Tracy. They're spending money on hot tubs, uh, play sets from Costco, trampolines, above grand pools, campers, boats. Yeah, okay. That's all fine because, again, I put this picture up different picture. This is the fun picture. This is the picture of Sam Piper's on the beach when I went to Florida with my husband after our father-in-law died. And, and I have two pictures in my office. This one represents play. And the one from the last episode with the gleaners in the field represents work. There's another mindset issue for Jen too. That polarity and a polarity is a problem or a challenge that's never going to go away. And Mm. what's never going to go away for Gen 2 is this dance that we keep doing because we need to work. Dad's calling me to check the fences or mom's calling me to to do the cutting under the fence rows. And then I've got my wife and and kids calling me over here. I only have my family's just very young. I don't get to spend time with them. And I always say, no excuses, man. 
you get to choose which dance, which side you're going to dance to. And you also get to put up boundaries around when is enough enough. And again, if you're in this sort of um, dangling carrot situation, so let's talk about why Gen 2 hates carrots. And that's what the blog is called, Why Farmers Hate Carrots. Carrots are, if you just do this, son, or if you just do this, daughter, I promise in five years, you can have this quarter. Or if you just do this, or you just be patient, I promise you, and then finish the sentence, right? No. That, a promise is not a contract, as Jillian Brown would say. And again, I am a big believer in trust and a big believer in open communication. And I'm a, a woman of my word. If I promise Tracy that I'm going to do something for you, it's going to happen. But in farm business, that's not a good habit to get into, especially for Gen 2. So this has kind of been a long answer, but that farming family living line is so important because if you if you're a family of four with young kids and you tell me that you're surviving and doing well on thirty five to forty thousand dollars a year, I'm telling you you're not that's not the real number and and you need to add in what the farm perks are, and maybe the number goes up to eighty thousand and that's maybe more reasonable but there's a lot of gen twos who are in slavery because they're working at a reduced compensation package for what? The promise, the promise of the farm. Just trust me, son. Someday this will all be yours. Biggest lie in agriculture. Don't listen to that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Psh, the screen blows up. Say it. Psh, yeah. yeah. Blows up. Nobody no, would do a job and and work while somebody would tell them, a boss would say, I promise you someday you will get paid or you will get a raise, right? Nobody's gonna continue on doing that for very long. No, no so, so there's the fear of failure, which we mentioned. There's also that fear of not being good enough that I mentioned that I think is just horrible. And so the appreciation that you want to give to your parents for all of the opportunity and the the leg up and the assistance they've given you is great, but it should also come the other way. Gen 1 should also be telling you, Gen 2, that they appreciate you, that they're not taking you for granted, and they, they don't feel that you have a sense of entitlement. Because a lot of young farmers say, oh, Elaine, I don't want to talk to my parents about what their net worth is and what their personal wealth level looks like. That would make me sound really greedy and entitled. I go, no, it wouldn't. That actually makes you sound smart. Like you want to know all the numbers so that you can make really good decisions. And you also want to know, what if there's not, what if there's not only one Gen 2, Tracy? What if there's two, which is what I'm coaching right now, two brothers who both want to come back to a cattle farm? Complicated. Is there, yeah, because then, then, then the question is, how much does each family need to get paid from the farm? Because is the viability there for this cattle ranch to support three separate family units? And, and you know, we talk, we're talking a lot about money, but that's kind of the, ba the benchmark and the baseline for how people move resources around to get what they need. <laughs> I got to share a quote. I love this okay. one too. So they say money is not everything, but it's right up there with oxygen, right? <laughs> okay. At the end of the day, we can't ignore money because that's how we live and that's how we accomplish what we want, right? And I love that you're putting so much emphasis on knowing the numbers to live, knowing the farm numbers. And I think, you know, as generation two, that can be an intimidating conversation to start with your parents, especially if they haven't been transparent, right? Right. And so you just keep asking and, and you might want to ask for an outside facilitator to help facilitate that conversation. Okay. So you spoke about mindset and I'm glad we spent a lot of time on that mindset and we weaved in to explore a little bit. Is there anything that you wanted to touch on explore before we move on to communicate, communicate, communicate? Well, an another thing I think I want to explore is the whole in-law factor thing, because I had another situation recently where the daughter-in-law is on my Zoom call and she says, Elaine, I am so done with being called the outlaw. I said, what? And I, and I looked at her husband and I said, you allowed that behavior from your parents? 
So here's another phrase that pays. You get the behavior and the language that you allow. Another call I had this week was on profanity. And I said, what's the most hard thing for you coming back to the farm after you've been at an outside ag business job? I said, Elaine, there's no laughter here. And there's way too much profanity. And I go, oh, isn't that interesting? Because on our farm, there's no profanity. It's just, it's part of our culture. Not, that's just, yeah, that's not happening. So, so, you know, exploring what you expect to be acceptable and what's workable and what's not, what's not workable. So when, when you're wanting to get this, this transition journey conversation started, Another tip that, that just come to mind, Tracy, that I've, I've had a couple of young people write me back and tell me, Elaine, I thought this is the most stupid idea you've ever seen you put on Twitter. But then they actually, <laughs> of course, but then they actually went and did it. And it was so good to hear her because this is a very smart professional egg woman in Ontario. And she says, dear Elaine, when I read your blog about power of a letter, I thought you were a little bit whacked out, but. <laughs> I've come to realize that one of the ways that I can communicate clearly and organize my thoughts the best is with Microsoft Word because I can erase things, I can use better words, I can put it in a document, I can go to bed, I can come back the next day, sleep on it, look on it fresh the next morning. And she said, I just want to thank you for the power of a letter. And so, again, Tracy, we talked about for the Gen 1 that they need to know what they want. Same thing goes for Gen 2. Do you as Generation 2 know what you really want? Do you know what you want for your family? Elaine, I do not want to work 24-7. Okay, there's three family units on your farm. Why aren't you getting every third weekend off? Why? So why is a really good question, right? So, so on the family side, what does it you want from the family? But then again, what do you want from the business? And, you know, do you want to be super big? Because some, you know, there's a season in Saskatchewan, I don't know if you recall, where people were like bragging about, oh, my farm is 22,000. Oh, my farm is 44,000. Oh, my. And people are going, oh, big sounds really good. Big is crazy. And I've coached some of those big families. And you know what they've done? Yeah. They become 8,000 acre farms. Because they, th they found that they could not sustain and have what they wanted as a family if this got way out of hand. And so I it's, that point. yeah, yeah, right? And so how, here's the question, <laughs> don't take this the wrong way. How big is big enough, right? So you, you wanna figure out what works for your family. So you may be coming back as Gen 2. And again, another um, sort of scenario here, sort of a sidebar is off farm, <clears throat> excuse me, off farm income. So in my situation, my daughter-in-law has a degree in nursing and can make a lot of cha-ching as a nurse. She also has three children, three years of age and under. So it's a very busy household. So her decision is to put her energy and talents into raising a family and working in our seed business with her husband. Good for her. Another farm woman might say, you know what, Elaine, we can't afford not to have my off-farm income because I'm the family living line for our, our farm. And so she puts in it. And, and I have to tell you this crazy story because it's unbelievable. I had a client once whose income, Tracy, was a million dollars a year. The yeah. farm or the off-farm? The off-farm. Wow. And it was, it was uh, an online business and multi-level marketing, and that's all I'll say. Good for them. The problem with that is that the father-in-law had no idea of the size of the income and the son who was farming with father was getting zero wage, which is stupid because at some point if that wage changes or there's a maternity leave or it, it decreases, I mean, that's, that's an extreme example, but let's just say that income was even 80 grand a year, which is a decent income. It trains the father to think he never has to pay the son. And then when the son wants to go and buy out the uncle, where is the disposable income to do that? Because he never got a salary. And I saw that case happen again in Manitoba where two sons got almost no wage. One was married to a nurse, so the groceries got bought. The other son ate lunch all the time at his mother's house. 
And then when uncle decides to pull away from the farm and sell his shares and equity to the nephews, they have no money because they've gone 11 years without getting fair compensation. So another really big issue that I see with Gen 2, and here's the question. Do you feel you're being fairly compensated? And how do you know it's fair? Okay. Powerful question. And that's when you get on Twitter and you talk to your buddies and you say, what do you get getting paid? Or how are you guys making this work? Or what's your compensation strategy? Because Peter Boyce, who's retired now from Boyce Financial in uh, Statler, Alberta, he and I are, are good colleagues through CAFA and I've done some work with his his, his team out in Stettler. And, and he and I both said, slavery is alive and well in agriculture. And it makes us angry. Oh, yeah. true enough. Yeah. True enough. Yeah. yeah. So again, so, you know, it comes back to the, the three big questions. And you know, I'll put them up now because we put them up last session. But again, this is helpful for Gen 2. Where is your income coming from? Are you going to rely totally on off-farm income? Are you planning to move to the home yard someday? And if so, is a lot of money going to go into renovations? Or are you going to be happy with the way it is for a while? Or maybe it's a decent house already. And then the last piece is fairness in, in terms of what the expectations are for your siblings who are not farming. Because, again, you get to inherit or buy at fair family price or fair market value some of the land, pieces of the land. And your siblings are going, oh, must be nice to be you. You get everything because you're the farmer. He's never, the farm woman or man is not going to sell it. It's not something that's going to be flipped. It's a, an entity to create wealth for future generations. And here's the other thing Jan 2 needs to think about. How are you behaving towards your non-farm siblings? Do you care about them? And do you care for them to be successful? Because I have another story of a wonderful young farmer. I'll call him Charlie. That's not his real name. Charlie had an alcoholic father who divorced his mom. And his mom and he were very close. He also had some uncles who were not easy to get along with. And he ended up having to move provinces to start over with his operation. And I won't describe any more because I don't want to uh, cause... Confidential. Exactly. My point is, is Charlie sat all of his siblings down and said, I am willing to take risks in agriculture because I'm passionate about my business. One of our brothers is coming with me to help us do this. But I want you to know that if you are ever in any need of any kind, I will do my level best to support you out of the revenue from this farm. Because this farm is a business and it's here to give us life and breath to our family and provide for us. And, and my brother and his family. But I need you to know that the culture that I'm coming from is one of abundance, and I'm here to support you should you need that to happen. Okay. We have the same culture in the Fraze family. I mean, my sisters are professionals. One's a lawyer, one's a master's of social work, one's a nurse, married to a farmer, now retired. But the same deal was in our family, is that if anybody was in any need for any reason, you knew that there was a safety net with us. And it's never been called on thus far, but everybody's getting their government checks now, so maybe things are great, but don't count on that either. It's not very much. Yeah. Okay, that's a good point. I love that mindset, explore. Do you want to move into communication? We've kind of yeah. weaved our way through that a little bit. I mean, the whole basis of farm success between generations is communication. How many times did I say it in the last one? Communicate, communicate, communicate. And I could almost do it 10 more times because yeah. that's key, right? Right. So again, back to the bowl in the middle of the room. And this is my Beanie Baby Bowl that I use as a talking stick. Everybody knows the challenges or maybe you don't know all of them, but you know a lot of them that you need to start talking about. So you need to start calling family meetings. And for Gen 2, they need to be the driver of the process. If you really want to be the successor of your farm, if you really want clarity of expectations, certainty of agreements, and timelines in place, then you need to commit to action, and you need to get those meetings happening. And again, Tracy, go to Staples, go to Office Depot, get yourself a $200 really good flip chart, 
because with the flip chart, you can dump all the agenda items. You can see the path flow of how ideas are flowing. And then at the end of the meeting, you just take your phone and take a picture and um, everybody then has a digital document on what was decided as to what was discussed, what was promised, who's going to act on it, and what are the timelines and expectations for its completion. The other thing I want you to think about is how you give difficult feedback. Because quite honestly, Generation 2 feels that they're better communicators than Generation 1. <laughs> That's not always the case. So the other thing with phones is, um, is texting. Right? So um, I tried calling my son today to see when our flax is blooming because we got people wanting to come to do photo shoots. <laughs> and I, he, won't, he won't pick up the phone, which is normal. So if I want to talk to my son, I have to text him. And that's fine. Um, but I'm a pick up the phone kind of communicator. So again, communicate with other people on the farm team the way they like to be uh, communicated with. But the family meeting, the, the Dr. David Cole's research found out that the families that actually met on a regular basis were 21% more profitable. So what would it look like in 2020 with all of the flooding and the not getting the crop in and the hailstorms in Saskatchewan and all these things that are just on top of going through the great pause, what, what would it look like to actually start for you as Gen 2 to be the driver to keep things moving? and say, we are going to meet on the first Wednesday and the set, third Wednesday of every month at nine o'clock. The first Wednesday is going to be operational. The third Wednesday is going to be strategic succession transition planning. And just get the momentum rolling. I love and that it's you said that because sometimes I'd imagine there's a lot of generation two that are sitting at home working at home, working in the fields, I'm saying sitting, but they're paralyzed, right? Because there's been little tidbits of conversation and they're expecting their parents to bring it up. But I'm going to guess if it's not a topic of conversation that comes up regularly and nobody's brought it up yet, it might not come up. So the second generation, if they want it to happen, they should probably bring it up, right? Well, there's a saying in James or somewhere in the wisdom literature, you do not have because you do not ask. Love it. And so you come, you come, from, a, you come from a stance of curiosity. Mom and dad, I'm just curious. Could we set aside a family meeting on Wednesday at 9 o'clock? Um, I'll bring a flip chart, but I just want to start exploring what you want for the season of life that you're in now. And quite frankly... I'm in a season in life where I need to start getting some equity and some ownership and some power control because here's, here's another blog I just did that I got a lot of, a lot of good feedback on, but it's the, the roles and task map from the Hudson Institute where I trained as a coach. In your 20s, it's about being independent. In your 30s, it's about mastering success. In your 40s, it's about taking power and control of your destiny. So if you're watching this and you're 38 – which, by the way, is six farmers I've been working with in the last four months. Like, the 38-year-olds are coming out of the woodwork. I don't know what's going on with 38-year-olds. But I kind of do know what's going on. And what's going on is they're going, oh, my goodness, this is hard. And this is hard work. And I'm, I'm working hard as an employee of this farm. But when do I get to be a part owner? And when do I get to have the opportunity to leverage that equity so that I can grow this business in the direction that I want to grow it. And that's why it's, that's why I ask everybody, Tracy, how old they are. I'm 63. At my stage, I'm supposed to be starting over and creating legacy and being a mentor. And, and I do have my act together. I have a succession plan. I have a will. I have a power of attorney, which is something different. It's the estate plan. But I also have a lifestyle plan to know that I have enough money to live well till I'm 102. And I have a house that's paid for, has been paid for for over 20 years. And I also know I'm not moving because my son built his own house because that's what he and his wife wanted. So that's great. They got what they wanted and I didn't have to move. So again, you don't know what the prescription is going to be, but you have to be willing to make the best decision for the time and the season that you're in now. And if you're sitting back, like you say, waiting for the parents to come and stick their face in your, in your business about what you want, 
a lot of times the parents are all, it's, it's kind of like the picture where you see people being back to back and all they have to do is turn around and start having a conversation, but they don't even see each other because they're, they're not looking to have that conversation. Well, and going back to your quote that you left in the last video, clarity is kindness. And if you're Being not clear is kind. clarity, yeah. well, how can you get it? Ask the founders, bring up the meeting. I love that, right? Because I know myself, I like to have control of my destiny, right? And I could just imagine being there at 38 or whatever age and going, oh my goodness, what's going on? Like, nobody's going to talk about this. That's a terrible feeling and a terrible weight on the shoulders. Doesn't well, feel I call, right. And I call that the pain of not knowing. So in William Bridges work in our coaching training, that's called the neutral zone. And so just remember those gear shifts, you know, like in those old Volkswagens, they're not going anywhere, right? Cause they're in, in neutral, but when you're in the neutral zone, it, it's called the pain of not knowing. And so it's like a woman waiting to be engaged and have the ring and the question pop. And I guess it works both ways. Women ask men now too, it's 2020, whatever. But once a diamond ring or an engagement ring goes on, you know, there's likely going to be a wedding and you're out of the neutral zone and you're now into marriage phase, right? So in transition planning, what do you want to do as Gen 2 to get out of that pain of not knowing? So sit down and write out, dear mom and dad, this is what I'd like to know. And just brain dump all the things that you'd like to know. But mom and dad would also like to know, are you trainable? Do you want to learn and be mentored? Or teach? are you teachable around the things that you're not quite so hot at? And I do personal style assessments from CRG Leader Group, the work of Dr. Ken Keese, who I've also trained with. And he has a book called, um, oh, now I've forgotten. It's got fish on the cover. Why aren't you more like me? Okay, so we're all different. So on our farm, so on our farm, my style is influential. I'm really good for people and I'm really good for tasks and I'm really good for being expressive, which is why I'm a professional speaker. But that would be a hint to anybody out there that wants a visual presentation done virtually. Just, just saying. Holy. But my, hus my husband is task-oriented and his style is ambitious, determined. So when I mention that the patio furniture needs to be put away for winter, by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the flat deck is in my front yard and the furniture is going to the shed. Nice. My son, on the other hand, is called... Um, responsive balance, which means he is very wired for people. So he, was, he spends longer on the phone, more time with the sales reps. But the upside of that is our sales on our seed business have also gone up because he's a relationship seller. And then he married this wonderful woman who's my daughter-in-law, who is called um, practical. And practical means perfectionistic and pays high attention to detail and cognitive. So she is the perfect person to be our office administrator and do the C decks and check the invoicing and the accounts receivable and all that other good stuff. Absolutely. And we also have a hired bookkeeper. But what it, why I went through this story is there's four family members on, on the team on this farm and we're all different. And if you know what your strengths are, you should be working from your strengths. So I have this thing from Dick Whitman called the performance roles and responsibility sheet. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses and how can management support you more? And what are your learning goals for the next year? And so my curiosity for Gen 2 is, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And the weakness that's really bothering me the most, Tracy, is there isn't financial transparency between the generations. Generation two is there as the workhorse and they're working hard and they're sorting cows and they're cutting silage and they're checking crops and they're doing everything in their power to please the next, the, the founding generation. But nobody stopped the bus to say, how are we farming the numbers or how are we making good decisions collaboratively so that if dad or mom drops dead from a heart attack next week or gets dementia, that you don't have a lot of stuff you don't know because you had a learning plan in place to make sure you had all of the farm management angles covered. And, okay. you know, farm management is not a, not, a, not a thing that you can avoid doing. And, and my whole thing in farm management is around the communication piece 
and being willing to say, you know, dad, I'm not very good at doing this. If you're not going to teach me, who's going to help me learn how to do this? I love and that. And then it also goes, it also goes the other way because of course our son is the IT specialist on the farm being 32 years old. So when I need to hotspot my phone and find out if I can upload faster internet, I have to call him and say, Hey, Ian, you know, help me out here because something's not right with, with the way I'm trying to do my business either. So it's, it's just so important to recognize that, that you can say, what would you like me to do differently? And that's a wonderful line to use to open up to possibility and feedback so that the work that you're doing is actually the work that you're wired to do. Oh, I love that. That is very thoughtful. Okay, so mindset, explore, communicate, and I hear a lot of action in there. Do you have any more thoughts on the act? You've given some really good points throughout. I th if you can top that, wow. That's I'll okay. Impress. That's all right, Trace. Again, uh, we said before, talk does not cook rice. So if you want something done, you have to act. And there's another good mantra in business that I like, and it's called focus and execute. So yesterday I was coaching a young family. The babies were bouncing on their knees, a three-year-old, a seven-month-old. And I asked one question. So do you have a will? Mm. And I said, after you get off this Zoom call, you are going to call your lawyer to make an appointment because something has to be in place. And again, I have done seminars, Tracy, where three months later, after a person has been in my seminar, they pick up the phone to say, Elaine, we're so sorry to let you know our son has died under a piece of farm equipment. And again, I don't want to keep telling these sad stories, Tracy, but action is what do you need to do to decrease the risk that you're putting your family out of being in chaos? Now, because we're in this interesting situation, uh, my friend Laura McDougall Williams, who's with me and had it out of the Suez office in Manitoba, she just told me that we can do digital witnessing. So you can actually get your will done from a distance. You make the call, you draft up the first draft, you review the second draft in another meeting, and then in the third meeting, you can get it digitally signed. You don't actually physically have to show up at your lawyer's office. And I don't know if all lawyer's offices are doing that, but some of them are. So that's just an example of, of we talked before in, in the other episode about having a binder. So wills and estates, that's one chunk. Your lifestyle plan, are you being fairly compensated? So act. Look at your bank statements from 2019 and see how much money did, it, did you need to actually live. And there's freebies, there's perks coming from the farm. So go to farmfamilycoach.com and ask for my compensation worksheet from Dick Whitman. And I'm happy to give that to you so you can figure out what your farm perks are. I also want you to have a sheet that says business plan because I want you to be clear about what your vision is for the farm. When Ian came back from university, he wanted to grow hemp. Okay, we're a certified seed business. So we grew hemp for a very short time and it went south for mostly the reasons of marketing and not being paid on time. But it's also a really nasty crop to harvest and it's got like this two day window. The other thing you wanted to do was to have bison. Well, so far there's no bison on our farm, but we did give him a piece of property as leverage for equity to start buying land that it was already fenced. So if you, you know, wanted to send some of your cows from your place to my house, oh. Trace, I have a quarter section that's fenced. I might take you up on that one day. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long way from your house to my house to haul cattle. Yeah. And I grew up on a cattle farm, so I'm really good with not having to chase cattle. If you check the no. cows for me, it's a deal, Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm not real good at that. I'm about 40 years out of practice with that. So in this binder, you have, you have the wills and estates. You have, and, and then I also remember, want you to go to your lender. And I want you to take your current net worth and say, if, if my spouse and I wanted to buy something off our parents and to get into this farm business equity sharing thing and start transferring some of the ownership, how much am I good for? And, and that's a very interesting exercise. And the other thing for daughter-in-laws is... I want the farming husbands to understand here that where is it written that your father and mother are going to die or get 
incapacitated before you are. And I don't say that as a threat or a heavy thing. It's just another reality check for life insurance, for the wills to be updated, and for you to talk about the what if. So another plan of action that would be really, really good to do is what if. And Wes and I talk often about, you know, what if one of us died? We actually talk about who we would marry or what kind of person or would we get married? And, and it was a shockeroo because the financial planner looked at Wes and he said, and she said, uh, Wes, who are you going to marry when Elaine dies? And he goes, say what? And, and he was just totally sideswiped by that question. And, and, and then she asked me and I said, nobody. And he said, how come you answer so quickly? And I said, well, because I don't really have a need to want to be married to anybody else. And I'm happy being married to you. But if you died, and we, we had a situation in October of 2017, where my husband was about four inches away from dying in a truck crash. And so I've already gone through that thought process. But this week, I was looking at a daughter-in-law. And I could see the tears in her eyes. And I saw the tears in his eyes, too, because I said, are you afraid of something happening to him? And what happens to you if something happens to him? And that is back again, Tracy, in the neutral zone. Because as the daughter-in-law, she doesn't know. There hasn't been a conversation about how she's protected or cared for if her husband dies. Dying is one thing. But what if he's incapacitated? If he's incapacitated, he's not dead. The life insurance doesn't become executed, and neither does the will. And, you know, we've had these conversations with our daughter-in-law, even in the event of divorce, which is a whole other scary topic that people want to tread lightly around. But our coach looked us right in the face and said, okay, Wes and Elaine and Ian and Kendra, you are going to talk about the phrase family divorce. What's going to happen if that happens? And then we had the discussion. And so it's clear what people's intentions are. So in conflict resolution, Tracy, it's called intent, action, effect. I have no idea what you're thinking right now other than we really should be wrapping up this call. And, you know, I can't tell what you're thinking unless you tell me and speak it out and put it on the table. And then I get to share with you the effect of what you've just said. So intent, action, effect is conflict resolution 101. And what's wrong in farm families is people are guessing what our intent is, and it's time that we start putting it on the table. I love it, Elaine. That is powerful wisdom. Elaine, that was all fantastic. That whole episode, you know, I think these are much needed conversations. And I know myself, there's a lot of Gen 2 out there that are eager, ambitious. They love the farm equally as much as the founders. And they're just paralyzed. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to start. And you gave so much wisdom in that episode. So thank you so much. I know I did a call out to farm coaches in the last one. And I'm going to do it here in this episode as well. Because... You know, saying we got to do these things is one thing, but sometimes we get stuck in a circle in the knowledge that's in our head, right? Until we get new knowledge, we can't think different. Or there's set patterns of communication or no communication. And maybe sometimes it makes sense to bring in an experienced individual like a farm coach, whether it's you or individuals across Canada. Can you touch on that a little bit? So when you're looking for someone to facilitate communication, there's nothing wrong with uh, seeking them out, asking for a complimentary half an hour discovery call. And that's what I do with people who seek me out. And if they're in a different province, I have other colleagues in, in uh, Pierrette de Rocher out of Quebec, Martine Deschamps is in Quebec, um, in BC, Eben Lau in Abbotsford does this kind of work. Uh, Bob Tosh with Myers Norris Penny in Saskatoon is a facilitator and uh, all kinds of people are, are willing to do that. Denise Fitzpatrick, uh, Filipchuk, um, I always call her Fitzpatrick, sorry Denise, Filipchuk um, up in the Swan River area. There's different people that are more than willing to sit in that space and again, caffinet.com would be another 
a good resource for families to reach out to. The other thing I want to want to mention, Tracy, is one of my clients this week has has tweaked me on again to listening to audio books. And this is my book, um, Building Your Farm Legacy, which I've now turned into a um, audio book. So if you just go to my website at farmfamilycoach.com, you can get it on audio, and that's a great place to start as well. And I'm a big fan of Brene Brown's work. And I mentioned, I think, Marilee Adams, Change Your Questions, Change Your Life. So there's lots of resources out there, but I think the main thing is to start the call to action for Gen 2 is, first of all, sit down and write out what is it that you really want. And then I want you to put some timelines around that. By this amount of time, this is what I'd like to have happen. By this amount of time. And so that your parents know that you have a well-thought-out ask or process that you want to that you want to go with and the other thing I want to want to mention too is again we mentioned the power of a letter and writing out your thoughts and, and presenting that to your parents to let them have time to digest it I love so, that idea. because again we have four different styles of communication some of us are very people oriented like my son and I uh, my husband is very action oriented very concise very brief I mean his his sentences for our succession plan weren't even complete sentences they were like groups of three or four words. That's just the way he, he's a very efficient kind of guy. Um, and my daughter-in-law, you know, she might, she would have perfect printing. So her, she would, and, and in a different color pen. So everybody is, is different in how they like to communicate. So it's either action, process, people, or ideas. And again, I have that in my Farm Family Toolkit. So if you just go to farmfamilycoach.com, um, a window will pop up asking if you'd like the Farm Family Toolkit. And I would start there. There's 19 different tools for you to use to just start getting this process um, moving forward. And again, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. And I just, I just want people to look at that picture again that's behind me. I love going to the beach and being by water. Uh, my dad was in the Naval Reserves and he took us to the water a lot. But I have these two pictures in my office as a contrast to remember that, yes, we want to work and do well in our farm business, but we also need to take time for play. And so it's not either or, it's both. And so I, I really want, I want young families to think about what are you saying yes to in the family and what are you saying just be patient, maybe, maybe later, maybe later, when really what you need to be saying to is on the farm side and it's no dad. I won't be helping you sort cows on Sunday afternoon. I've promised my family we're taking family time. And, and people who are workaholics don't want to hear that. And so, Tracy, that's a whole other episode because I have a blog on workaholism. And when we talk about farm transition, a lot of spouses are not happy of the threat of their husbands becoming a mini duplicate of their father-in-laws. So let's be careful. Let's be careful what we ask for and let's be clear about why we're asking for what we want. And once we understand our why and we can share our passion and our purpose and our intent with our families, then they'll, it'll be a lot easier for them to understand how we're going to get what we all want. I love that. Again, if they want to find those tools you mentioned or connect with you, how do they find you, Elaine? Farmfamilycoach.com. It's all there. Go to my contact page if they want to ask me for a discovery call, and I'd be more than happy to uh, refer them to other coaches across the country, too, that might be helpful to getting those tough conversations started. Excellent. It's doable, and you're not alone. And remember, you don't have to keep sitting in the neutral zone and that pain of not knowing. It's time to figure out what you want and to ask for what you need and to get it done. It's now. Powerful. Powerful, Elaine. Thank you so much. You are such a wealth of knowledge, a pillar for this community. We are lucky to have you. And as always, it's a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. Have a great summer. And thank you guys for tuning in. If you love this episode as much as I did, like it, subscribe to the channel and share it out. There are so many other farmers out there that need to hear what Elaine has to say. So share it, like it, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye. 
You've been listening to Impact Farming. For more great episodes and articles designed to help you manage and grow your farming operation, head on over to farmmarketer.com. Don't forget to sign up while you're there. We will see you on the next episode.